A couple weeks ago, I interviewed a guy calling himself almost a doctor, who is almost a doctor, and uh, one of the things that he studies is spectroscopy. So we specifically were talking about spectroscopy. I have the entire video linked in the description as well as the link to his channel. I'd love it if you went and subscribed to his channel. He has some fantastic things on there. Um, I'm going to mirror here just a short segment of it, the part that's very cool and, and very pertinent to uh, what some flat earthers don't quite understand about spectroscopy. So here it is, just a short segment of it with Almost a Doctor. So I like this one because it's sodium. You might recognize this color coming off um, old street lamps because they used to be just sodium bulbs. Okay. And they have, and sodium has two bright bands in the yellow. So it looks like one bright one there, but it's actually two just very close to each other. But it matches up. And there you go. But you can also see sodium, despite the orange, is a tiny bit of green there, a little bit of red. But okay. this this is one that's used commonly in light. So you can actually look, it's orange. Okay, we see orange bands. Makes sense. And but this is the next bit. This is an, a full spectrometer that will not only do what I did, it'll do it to a much higher resolution. And it's smaller than a tape measure, or at least the holder for it. So it does everything I just did in a few seconds. And what's connected to it is an optical fiber, a single mode optical fiber. So not quite the ones that you use in telecommunications, much thinner and designed just to, with a very narrow opening. So it's got a very, very narrow angle of entry. So basically whatever you directly pointed at, it's going to take that light in, do everything I did with the diffraction grading, uh, have a little electronic panel to tell you. But the reason I've done it in this order is that I then went on and I do have photos and videos if anyone doubts it, although at this point I hope not, to actually measure what, what does it spit out. And this was the, the output of it. And I put black lines over those theoretical marks for the bands that I measured earlier. So you're looking at those dotted lines oh, and you can okay. see that they match up. Plus there's that violet one. There's the violet one there. And then there's another one that's below 400 our eyes. We, this is now in the UV, so I wouldn't be able to see this. You wouldn't be able to see this. We just physically can't. But there you go. There's the the one around kind of. There's the two in the sort of the greeny yellow region. Then you get the um, that would have been the the violet, the blue one, violet, and then ultraviolet. And you can see tiny little dips. That's actually just backgrounding with the fluorescent lights. It's kind of oh, pointed from, from the room. Yes. Okay, so you do, yep. but you can control for it, but you can see the difference. Yeah. But the reason I wanted to show this is that I'm going to point that spectrometer at the sun because I want to show that mm. that black body spectrum that they, they tell you about is true. And so I just wanted to show that the mini spectrometer gives you the, gives you the results we expect. Now, yes, they're not perfectly on there, but as you saw, there's always scientific error and you might get a slight bit off with the calibration, but the black lines appear pretty much where you, we expect peaks to be and you see peaks where you expect them. And if you go into the literature and search up multiple papers, you can also find them for, for the other ones. But I'm just trying to show the three that I showed. And so now we actually have really detailed ones and you can see how narrow they are. When you see narrow spikes, that's a mission because it comes out at that one wavelength. As I said, the energy needs to be right. Yeah. And by, and which means the wavelength and the frequency has to be correct. It has to be the same. It has to be right. You can't you can't be half assed about like you can't be in between. It's like a ladder, you can't step halfway between a rung. So then the Fraunhofer lines, you can show them with this. And if you expand it out and you do what I did um, with the emission lines, but you do it more detail, these are not my results, but anyone can go and do this. So if anyone doubts these results, go do it. Show us how we're wrong. When you take the the, light, the emission from the sun, you can just see kind of going left to right and then going down is decreasing wavelength or increasing frequency. You can see that there's bands missing, there's dark spots. And those are the absorption lines for all the different elements in the sun. Now, I've shown this in emission just because it's a bit easier as a demonstration, but in terms of measuring, absorption is actually easier. And it's the opposite way around. You just try and light through it and see what goes missing. And, and the things that go missing are, why do they go missing? It's because the reverse process of emission. If the light has the same energy of one of the um, electronic band gaps in the, or the electronic, or the difference in the energy levels in your element, then it will be absorbed. 
because that process is reversible. If you're talking about molecules, it's not quite reversible. It gets really, really complicated. But when you're talking about elements, which if you're talking about anything as hot as the sun, you're not going to have molecules. Everything's broken into elements. Yeah. It's plasma. Or plasma. Right. Like, uh, oh, yes. Generally. And also there's another thing too that, um, I'll, that we get to consider with a bit of maths later too mm. while getting sort of closer to plasma. But when you're dealing with, and so that process is reversible. If, if I know where the light comes out, when I pump energy in, if I pump energy, if I pump light in, it'll be absorbed. And so this is just when I showed you earlier, you've got continuous spectrum, you've got emission, and then you've got absorption like this. And I can use that other spectrometer to do uh, absorption measurements. I just need a basic continuous light source, or so a white light source or something with a black body as well. And then I can look for dips. Everything's just inverted. And I did a lot of that for my my honours where we would do that. So I can show the picture at the beginning where we would do um, Fabry Perot interferometers and see if we can get the, the energy to couple, but that's a whole other story. But if you want to stretch it out, you notice that you get specific bands and they're labelled with just letters to just associate which band is which, and I don't even remember which what they all are. But what's important is that all of those little bands so um, match up with certain elements. Now, coming back to this one, we now can explain the black body and we can also explain some of the missing bands, but it also explains the red one. It also explains why there's sudden dips, so light missing after we pass through the atmosphere. We've got chemicals in the atmosphere. Now, you'll notice for the visible part, there's no, there's, whilst there's mini dips, there's nothing huge. It's... Like to our eyes, that'll appear white because it's so there's enough of it that yeah. whitish without ignoring sunset uh, when you have other effects, which is scattering going on. But if you look beyond that, beyond 700, which is in getting into the infrared, you'll notice that molecules that to us look clear now start absorbing at very specific wavelengths. So we know we've got O2 in the atmosphere, we've got H2O, and that's just. When you're in infrared, you also you can be doing bending and stretching modes, but it's the same thing. If I have some transition that has a certain amount of energy to excite it, if the light has that energy, it'll be absorbed and it'll excite it. And it can come back out, but when looking at light coming through something, it'll go missing. This is pro the absorption is probably the hardest one to to describe from scratch. Uh, hopefully I'm I'm not losing too many people with it. But it is important to note that the atmosphere has an effect, but we know what's in the atmosphere. You can measure it. You could do what I did yeah. earlier. You can just shine a white light source through a section of like a sample of the atmosphere and see what goes missing. And then you yeah. can use that to account for it. This you is, can, this you can is... vary things by adding, intentionally adding more water to the air, having more oxygen yep. in there. All right. And and what my PhD in is building environmental detectors essentially so i will know what gas i'm looking for and so i'm relying on the fact that this thing is reliable and repeatable and i will go out and i'll be like okay this wavelength will be absorbed by this chemical or one of the bands by this chemical i'm mainly looking at methane at the moment okay so let's see how lot match light goes missing and exactly how you measure that you can get very very creative i basically make methane sing with a laser but i I'll make a video on that eventually, but it'll probably be towards the end of my PhD when I can actually say I've done it. Um, at this point, I'm still proving it, which is the whole point of a PhD. But we know what's in the atmosphere. We can account for it. And it also it describes why when you look at the yellow one, there's, which is I know it's a bit hard to see, there's all those dips. If I measure this, if I take that same spectrometer and I point the fibre optic out the window at the sun... It's also what I see. Now, you'll notice that the scale and the shape is slightly different. That's also mainly because of my y-axis here. It just counts, whereas uh, before it's um, uh, irradiance. So it's a measure of basically energy per per area for given wavelengths. And that's that's one common way to do it. You can also do um, intensity too, uh, I squared. Um, that's So these are fairly arbitrary, but you see that same shape. So not only can I check that what they're telling us is correct, we measured it. You can actually see some of the bands from our atmosphere as well, but you can see the general black body outline. So, so for reference, this is, what is this? 
this is the this is when I pointed the spectrometer at the sun. This is what we measured. So when I got this one, the spectrometer, yep. and I can show that oh, it matches what I measured earlier, so it seems to be doing the right thing. If I take that and point it at the sun, this is what we get. All right. This is what we expected. Yeah, so it also matches up. So it looks like the spectrometer is doing its job. It looks like what they're telling us in the literature is correct. I know. It, it's, it's yeah, it's science quite is something that, correct. That the, the the reading in the books and the actual usage of it in reality matches. It's not yes. just reading it and reporting it back. It's actually going and testing it. And I think that's an important thing that a lot of people that haven't gone through higher education miss is that you don't get to just sit and read a book and report on it. That's not it. Yeah, you, they don't just tell things. you what to, to believe. What they'll tell you to do is how to do science, and then you'll go and practice it, and you will yeah. practice it, and you will practice it. You will test it. You'll be tested on it, and you will also do the maths yourselves. And if you're doing, say, physics, you'll have to learn programming so you can simulate it at yourself and show that you know the maths and how to predict these things too. Because, yeah, you can simulate all of this, although the maths here is simple enough that you can just do the maths. You don't. But there are some times where the maths gets too complicated and you have to simulate things. And and one of the, the equations later I'll, I'll mention, I actually did do that, though I don't have the results for that here because I couldn't quite find the assignment because, again, it was undergrad physics. But Okay. Yeah. So so I think it's important to, to say this again, that you can, with this, inst with this instrument or, or anybody else can, measure what's in the atmosphere. So you know what's in the atmosphere. Yeah. Right? You, you don't have to and then trust you point that it at somebody sun. else is telling you what's in the atmosphere. Yeah. You can verify it for yourself. Yeah. This is the reason I put this in here is it's not the best image of the sun, but it's me testing it to show that when they tell us this is what the spectra from the sun looks like, I can confirm it. Yeah. Again, notice the shape is slightly different, and it's to do with accounting for the axis, but you can look at where the dips are. And if I if I had more time, which you know I have to do a PhD, so I'm somewhat limited in that. Busy, I could go yeah. through and I could actually be incredibly thorough. I could take measurements of the atmosphere. I could normalize it. I can then um, fire them directly. At the sun. This one was just through the window, so that's also going to cut out some of the UV. Um, glass will start to block UV, so that's why we're probably missing a bit of some of the shorter wavelengths as well. Plastic's very good at doing that too, even clear plastic. So you'd need to, if you still wanted to fire it through something, quartz, you'd need quartz to fire because that won't absorb. But ideally you could just take it outside. But, you know, this was kind of tied up to computers in the lab and yeah. I had to get back to my my PhD. So this only took and, me 20 minutes to get and both of them. The windows in buildings tend to intentionally choose things to block certain wavelengths, you right? You, you don't want UV light coming in. To your house or your building where you're living and working necessarily right yeah and, and i don't know what the windows are coated with but even still for something where you haven't accounted for everything and i said it's very easy to do it if you want to prove me wrong you either buy one of these mini spectrometers although that despite being that small it's still about 12 grand uh mainly because it is small you can actually buy a bigger one at a bit cheaper price but as you said uh, as you saw earlier you could build one yeah. you can do this you can make one of these you can do it what I said. It's a couple of lenses yeah, and a prism. If, if you don't trust that somebody else built it right, you can build it yourself. Somebody yeah. got to the point where they're at, starting from the beginning, and other people could do that if they really wanted to because yeah. they didn't trust anything anybody ever said. And if you want help setting it up, I if I can spare the time, send me a DM. I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. But the... But I said, if you actually want the instructions on how to set up the previous one, you can you can actually look them up on the, the company's website. I won't rehash it here. But, yeah, th these are all freely available. No one's hiding it. Uh, you just have to know where to go to go look. But as I said, I only put this one in here. As I said, it's not the greatest one of the sun, but it shows that, okay, I measured, yeah. and it matches what they said. But if you want to take a more detailed one, all of those little dips and things, those are the black bands that we're seeing where there's, there's light missing. And now this is where we can start matching them up. We know what the emission lines are for a bunch of elements. I showed at the beginning that we know where they are, the emission and absorption lines. Now, do when we're dealing with the sun, basically what's happening is the sun is really hot and it's radiating out and then things are absorbing the light before it gets to us. So we get to see the outside of the sun. 
And we can see here that we've got a whole bunch of things, including calcium, hydrogen. Notice helium. I notice helium is in here, but we are narrow, but um, it, they haven't shown every single one of them. But helium, the reason it's called helium is after the Greek word for the sun, helios, because yeah. helium was discovered in the sun using spectrometry, uh, spectrometry before it was discovered on Earth. It's one of the, I believe, one of the yellow bands. If you want to see more of that, I did mention that in my 10 random science fat videos, so I've got a bit more there. Sorry, I don't mean to keep shilling my channel, but I just realized that well, I actually definitely. The cover link, that in more detail. The link to his channel is is uh, pinned in this. In, but, yeah, I will give channel. warning. My early vi videos are pretty terrible because it took me – I mean, Just watch the most recent 10 maybe. So I think uh, it's interesting here. <laughs> you've got calcium. You've got iron. You've got sodium. Uh, and it's not very difficult to figure out that we don't have lots of iron just kicking around in in this form in the atmosphere. Oh, yeah. This just tells you what we've got. The next bit is how you actually tell how much. All right. Um, now, I, I, I think my point is it goes back to the previous point of knowing what's in the atmosphere. We know what's in the atmosphere, and it's not mm -hmm. a lot of iron. Yes. So when we see things like this, and we also know we don't have much hydrogen. Now, here's another thing that the FLIRFs always annoy me with is when they say that, say, hydrogen and helium defy gravity. No, they don't. Gravity gives you an escape velocity. It's yeah. what, a half? Oh, sorry. It's square root of um, a number of terms. It's actually fairly simple. Um, but you, the maths tells you what escape velocity is. Now, when you have a bunch of gas molecules in a in a system i'm not going to say container because that system can be open it doesn't matter and um, the average velocity will be a result of the temperature but that's average like if i throw a bunch of balls into a ball pit and you know, keep shaking the whole thing or let's say i have a little container full of marbles and i shake it they might have an average velocity but they'll be smacking into each other some will have more energy than others and when you actually plot out the distribution of velocities for the lighter elements like hydrogen and helium, yeah, most of them are well under escape velocity, but a tiny fraction are above, which means all the time there is a small amount that is moving fast enough to basically launch itself out and never come back. And that's what's happening. That's why the lighter elements do that. But as soon as you get to the heavier elements, they, they don't, you don't actually get the distribution they crossing get that escape velocity. velocity. You can't so, pump enough energy into them at the temperature of our atmosphere to do so. So PhD Tony comes in with a formula V squared over R greater than G, gravitational constant, G, M over R, and M is the mass. Yeah, I, so I was trying to think of it in just terms of V, so yeah, you end up with square root. And, yeah, and that's, uh, when you think about it, that's very intuitive how, how that happens, yes. Yeah, basically, the heavier the mass you're trying to escape from, the more the faster you need to go, and it doesn't matter how heavy you are. Yep. Uh, but yeah, it's and of course, the further out you are, the, the sl you don't have to be going as fast. But the thing is, you can do that for gas too, and it, it it works. So we know there's not a lot of these things in the atmosphere. So that's that's also one of the ways that you can tell that when we're looking at them. Yeah, we're where this is coming from the sun. And so these are the absorption lines. Now in absorption, if you're dealing with low concentrations,